Today on Between the Lines, an author whose books have sold nearly half a billion copies. He's one of America's best storytellers, Dean Kuntz. I'm Barry Kibrick. Dean's unique talent for writing thrillers and tales of horror with the heart and soul is known worldwide. His insights, life lessons, and always sharp wit run through his work. But with his most recent story, he takes us on a journey of a different kind. With his book, A Big Little Life, a memoir of a joyful dog, Dean not only tells the tale of his beloved companion, but shows us that in each life, we can see great truth and beauty, and that the wonder of life with all its mystery is what makes it so worth living. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by the government of Puerto Rico's tourism company. Encouraging viewers to take a break and relax with a good book. Every page brings a new and exciting experience. Puerto Rico, we book adventure. I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was... You do, need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these features were as much as a month in preparation characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involves a lot of corruption. I don't get a chance to really talk about what's real, and that is the first thing to do. Dean Kuntz, what a privilege to have you grace our stage. Thank you so much for joining us here on Between the Lines. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. I am going to begin with Trixie's words, if you don't mind. Trixie is the the lovely dog that this book is all about. And she starts off the book with these words, dogs live most of life in quiet heart. Humans live mostly next door in desperate heart. Now and then will do you good to live in our zip code. The relationship between you and this dog and that beginning of that understanding really transcends throughout the book. Mm -hmm. That sense of this relationship and an understanding of both species. She, uh, she was next to my wife, the biggest life changer in my life. She was, um, she taught me by example to relax about things, that I, the things I thought mattered a lot didn't matter as much as I may have thought they did. By her example, her her jubilation, her joy in life, her uh, enthusiasm over everything. She gave me the ability to see that I could move to that quiet heart. Uh, and that quote you gave comes from a book of hers called Bliss to You, and where she writes about bliss and how to achieve it. And I saw in her and dogs that uh, in a good dog, in a, in a uh, dog like her, she lived in a state of bliss. Uh, even illness couldn't take that bliss away from her. She was a very uh, stoic little dog during illness, but uh, she never lost her sense of joy, even when she had spinal problems and, uh, and had pain. Uh, she never complained. And it was through that kind of example that she began to move me away from that, that human thing that I think we all have to some way that everything seems to matter too much to us sometimes. And we need to calculate what really matters and what doesn't matter so much, and we can begin to give away some of the concern about those things and live more like a dog with it. Well, you know, one of the things that it does for you that you express here is it restores your sense of wonder. Mm -hmm. That theme runs throughout the book, this sense of awe, this sense of wonder, and why that sense is so important. It's it's vitally important, not just because I'm a writer and I need it to write books that give you a sense of the universe and the wonder of the universe and the world we live in. It's important for anybody to have that sense of the world, that it's a wondrous place. Uh, and she gave this sense to me almost from the day she came to us. And I hadn't realized I'd lost my sense of wonder. Uh, given what I write, everybody thinks I've got this endless sense of wonder about things. And I do. I always did as a child. I grew up with it. Uh, but the vicissitudes of life, the, the fact that people in business sometimes betray you, that uh, it teaches you a degree of cynicism in life a little bit. And I hadn't realized I'd become 
a little cynical. And I hadn't realized that I had stopped looking at the wondrous nature of the world so much. And when this dog brought that sense back to me by her example, by her fascination with small things on a walk, and when I started looking at her and seeing how she saw the world, I realized that's how I used to see the world. And I want to see the world that way again. And she gave me the ability to get back to that, to that sense of childlike wonder that we should never lose, or otherwise we lose what's right with the world. Well, you know, you, you phrase it talking about the complexities, and yet it's funny how you saw these complexities through the simplicity of this wonder. I think that juxtaposition truly feeds the human spirit when you are aware to see the complexities and get away from simplifying it on one level and yet appreciating it on that simple level. It's a little hard to understand, but your book takes us through that. It's I, sort of an example of what you're talking about. As I say, when you, let's say you lived in a neighborhood for 20 years and you've walked that neighborhood hundreds of times and you know every block and you stop to see, uh, you stop seeing things. Things that are wonderful about it, uh, you, you've simplified it, just what you've said. You've taken the complex and you've made it simple by familiarity. And it's in the complexity of it that the beauty of it arises. And when you're able to suddenly to see, because the dog will stop and be fascinated with a particular set of tree shadows, that you, when you see what the dog's fascinated with and you start looking and you think, look at the amazing patterns of these shadows. And you start looking at the beauty of things that seemed simple to you or even mundane before and suddenly they're not mundane anymore and they're beautiful and you begin to recognize the world as a place of wonder that is a magnificent gift to us and we should always remain aware of how the simplest things are intricately beautiful. Well, you know, you also, I'm going to, again, it's Dean Koontz is here. Wh whose words would I rather use than yours anyway? Living with just that recognition, you say, it's a spiritual dimension of the world that you begin to recapture. That's one of the things that end up being missed. It's that spiritual dimension of the world. And that not only ensures a happier life, but also a more honest intellectual life. For wisdom without wonder is not true wisdom at all. We forget about that mm -hmm. key part so much. It's exactly true. It's, and I had drifted, as I say, not out of faith, but away from uh, faith that had been strong at one point simply because the world impresses itself too much and too aggressively upon us and there's so much to deal with and you get away from thinking about the spiritual aspect of things. And we're living in a secular world where anymore where you're almost sometimes mocked for having a spiritual view. Uh, but this dog brought me back to that through this regaining the sense of wonder. And when you regain a sense of wonder, you regain a sense of the ineffable, of that part of the world that we're never going to understand that's you begin to see the depth of things again that you saw when you had a spiritual life. Uh, and the spiritual life comes back to you, you begin to see that part of the world again. It's always, I, I've said to people who say to me, well, I just don't believe in God. And I said, well, that's of course your choice. Uh, I, uh, I don't hold that against you. That's your attitude about the world. I happen to believe in God and I look around the world and they say, but I see no proof. And I say, I see nothing but proof. Uh, and it's in the wonder of the world and the intricacy of it. I'm interested in quantum mechanics. I read a lot of quantum mechanics. I wrote a novel that uh, the basis of the novel was that quantum mechanics, the way it tells us the universe works and the world works, is completely compatible with religious faith. And that's what I see when my wonder is recaptured, of how intricately our lives are linked and how intricate the world is. And that it proves to me the world is a place of meaning and purpose. Well, one of the things, I, I told you there were a few things I had to leave out because if I discussed them with you, they could take up the entire show <laughs> just going there. But one of them I'm sneaking back in if that's okay. And that's this, you talk about the emotions and, and I guess the spirit and soul of an animal. And we know that there's controversy in that from even religious el elements of it all the way to the scientific. But there was a part that you wrote about that I do think we need to explore, and I want to read that to the viewers. You say, like so many specialists in every field, and these were the scientists who wrote off that dogs do not have a, a sense of emotion or anything like that. You say, they are educated not out of their ignorance, 
but into ignorance. They see the world through cloudy windows of theory and ideology, which obscures reality. And you realize with Trixie that she opened that door mm -hmm. for you. And you can see how, in fact, the, the line you use in the book is, that's why they predicted the uh, economic theory so properly, <laughs> is you know we pigeonhole everyone, and they are losing that sense of wonder. And it really does tie into intelligence. I mean, it's, it's there for us to see. It's, uh, I think it's the biggest problem of the world we live in. Uh, I think maybe we were originally designed for a simple world. The world is so complex that we've had to trust experts in everything. And what the experts do without realizing what they're doing is they narrow their focus and they concentrate on their specialty. And they think they know everything about their specialty. But the reality of the world is it's all interconnected. And you could spend your whole life studying a narrow uh, uh, economics uh, view of economics or a narrow political ideology, but all of those things relate to the real world and they have effects in the real world. And when you start losing an awareness uh, outside of your narrow specialty, as the rest of the world becomes a mist to you, you become obsessed with your narrow uh, focus. And in this book I talk about basically what is said about dogs, what specialists say about dogs who study dogs. Uh, it, that's changing because they used to be studied by people who didn't seem to have a passion about dogs themselves. Now, you're seeing a lot of people have a passion about dogs are doing a different kind of research. One thing I say in this book is, all these things that are said about dogs, that their emotions are not like ours, we anthropomorphize them, we translate our emotions to them, that they, they when we think, when we attribute something they're doing to a certain thought pattern, something they're interested in, that's not what they're interested in. They tell us dogs don't know about death. And I address all these things in the book and say, all you need is to have a very close relationship with the dog that is not a pet to you, but is a member of your family and is a companion to you and that you open your heart to and you open your mind and eyes to. And that dog will show you that none of this is true, uh, that it's misguided, it, it's, it's theory. And theory is not the real world. Uh, so in the book, I, I tried to take that step and show what more is going on in dogs in many ways than we ever give them credit for? You know, you said companion, and how you even get Trixie is through a wonderful organization that I know you're so involved with, and I did ask your publicist and I checked with you. I want to give out that organization because it is the Canine Companions for Independence, and these are the dogs that really help everyone from the blind to the lame to the, you know, in all sorts of emotional problems, whatever it is, they can train these lovely animals. To, to really be a part uh, and help someone's life. And I want to give out their website, and I know Absolutely. I have your permission. It's www.cci.org. And this is a, you can just tell from your dog and your experience how wonderful the work is that they do. And right afterwards, I was thinking about work, and, and I wanted to use your, your lines about the next topic, and that was work. As you say, if it's done with diligence and integrity, Work is obedience to divine order, a form of repentance. A large part of this book is becoming aware of that divine order through, not so much as you say the training that Trixie went through, but her own spiritual mm -hmm. component. Her, her, she was, uh, I have to say I was blindsided by what this dog did to me in my life. Uh, I thought she'd be a lot of fun. We'd have uh, good times together. I did not see her changing me profoundly as a person, uh, partly because I was, even though I'd written about dogs, I was a little bit ignorant about the fullness of the dog. And within her was uh, just a great deal of intelligence. The intelligence level is higher than we think. The, sen the sensory level, they, they have, their sense of smell is so many thousands of times greater than ours. It brings them more data than all of our senses combined. The dog sees the world in a very different way. And at times I became convinced that, as strange as it may sound to some people, I think uh, uh, dogs are aware of dimensions to the world that we're not. Uh, and what those are, I can't say, but I had a couple of experiences I talk about in the book that were otherworldly with this dog. And uh, 
they brought me to the point, I eventually say, that I saw her as a theophany, as a, a manifestation of God in my life because she had such a profound effect. And a do simple dog probably couldn't do that. So I think there is a spiritual side to dogs. Well, you say in the book, too many of us die without knowing transcendent joy. Now, you could take away faith and religion of any particular mm -hmm. type, but without knowing transcendent joy, without sensing something bigger than ourselves, if it's if it's just a spirit, it doesn't, it's not necessarily, I joke with people, it doesn't mean that there's a guy with a beard sitting up mm -hmm. there and a puppetry like that. We're just talking about a transcendent joy that allows you to feel a part of something bigger mm -hmm. than yourself. That is the thing that seems that when Trixie came into your life, not that you weren't aware of it before, I think you were intellectually aware of it before, but you seem to have been it seems to have hit a deeper chakra. It seemed to have gone into your own soul and, and become a part of you, not just in your, your, your mind, but mm -hmm. in your physical presence. It became, uh, over time with her, it became, uh, a, I would say, a, not just a daily awareness, an hour by hour awareness of the dimensions of the world of being different than what I had previously felt about them. Uh, and yes, you're right, I had an intellectual understanding of all of this is a part of something. All of us are a part of something bigger than ourselves. Uh, but uh, I hadn't addressed it, I think, on a deep emotional level until uh, this dog opened my eyes to that and brought me to, to a level in which the intellectual stuff became, uh, it became a part of me on an emotional level and on a physical level, not just on, on an intellectual level. Well, you know, you, you give us a little clue. You, you talk about when the supernatural steps into our world. When we do become aware of this, we, we tend to believe we have to see a burning bush or, or we have to feel this epiphany, this sort of new state of mind, and it's not. What you began to, to realize by having this one-on-one -on -one relationship was just those little things that nudge you mm -hmm. to that sense, to that presence of, of being. We had a, a, a couple of uh, monks to dinner at the house uh, two months before Trixie died. And of course, we didn't know she was going to die. And uh, we'd been told as long as we had her that she was special, there was unusual, something unusual about her. We heard it hundreds of times. And uh, one of the monks raised that same issue. And then they recommend me the Book of Tobit, which is uh, in the Apocrypha. And it's a very subtle dog story in which an angel befriends a man and saves his family and it, because of all the good work he's done. And he says to the angel at the end, but how did you know that I did this good work? And the angel said, because I have always been with you. And the only person always with him has been the dog. Uh, and so they, that was where this one monk said, when the supernatural enters the world, it's not a flamboyant thing. It's quiet. It's subtle. You're not made to see, no, wanted to see it on a flamboyant, obvious level. You're given the chance to see it if you open your eyes to see it. You know, even as we're talking about it, I, I'm going to take us away from the dog for a second because okay. it's important for people to know that there is someone else, and you mentioned her before, Gerda, in your life. <laughs> and she is your soulmate. And all these years you write, I am humbled by her faith in me and the love that inspires her offer, the light to lead me. I don't want people to come away here thinking you're like that lady with 45 cats and don't have <laughs> that, that other you know, <laughs> side to your life. So but, you know, share with us that this was really a duo. It was you and your lovely wife that, that both experienced this. And, and it's really, you're, you're still to this day feeding off of the love and her spirit uh, yes. as well. Uh, I was a senior and she was a junior in high school and I was a very shy kid. So I got turned, if I got turned down for a date with a girl, I never ask her again. But for some reason, I got turned down four times by Jerda. And uh, I, I tried well, to you imagine are what those- Well, you really are persistent. Four times, <laughs> you, and wow, that really, something was there, obviously. Yes. And, uh, and then after we were married, uh, uh, she uh, and I taught school for a couple of years. She uh, made me this offer. I'll, I know you want to write, she said. I'll support you for five years. And if you can't make it in five, you'll never make it. And I, 
tried to negotiate her up to seven, but she's got Sicilian blood, so <laughs> I had no chance. And, uh, but at least it was an offer you couldn't refuse. I couldn't <laughs> refuse it. And uh, I, I, that's what I talk about in the book is uh, our relationship. She has been the person who's uh, profoundly, most profoundly affected and changed me in my life. And then number two was this dog. And that I find, who would think that a dog would come in number two ahead of parents and everything else? But Jurda has been uh, just, I, I meant that truly. She's a light that led me. She was always ahead of everything in life. Uh, and even down to things like meeting someone, and I would, I always tend to like everybody on first sight, and Jurda's a very pleasant, personable person, but uh, she would say to me later, be careful with that person, and I would say, why? Oh, Jurda, they're perfectly fine. She was never wrong. And so she brought into it a wisdom, into our relationship, a wisdom I didn't share, and then I bring things she doesn't share. I have the creativity for words. She has creativity with numbers, so I never write a check. I never look after investments. She does everything on that end. So it was like we're utterly compatible in just about every single way. And it's been a marvelous, we've been married 43 years. So it's been, it's been a blessing. Uh, and I've had many blessings in my life. And it took me a long time sometimes to recognize them. Well, I, I think, uh, as I'll, I'll say in the beginning, I think 400 million books later, you probably <laughs> made up for that five year period. Am I correct? Yeah. You did okay? There, there was a while she had to worry. <laughs> well, you know, you said even in, in the book, I remember a line, it doesn't always go hand in hand, by the way, does yes. it? You know, you know that, that, that's, that success really can float by quite a few years, even after the productivity mm -hmm. is already put in and published yes. and all of that. I struggled for many years, and uh, because I didn't write what publishers wanted me to write, I've always had a stubborn streak, and I have to write what I'm passionate about writing, and I would write a book and they'd say, write the next one just like that. And that's death to me. I have to entertain myself when I sit down, so I have to do different things. And so it took a lot of years till I started getting a publisher who would give me a little bit of freedom and it wouldn't freeze up on me and say, oh, okay, that book's different, but we'll still publish it. <laughs> and uh, so it took a long time. It took, uh, I, at the end of five years, we were making a living at it, but I wasn't a bestseller for quite a few years thereafter. Well, you know, you have, uh, I'm thinking maybe all these publishers should listen to these, these words because you say, maybe loving dogs is a way we do penance for all other illusions we allow ourselves and for the mistakes we make because of those illusions. That's what those publishers, that's what those scientists, am I right? That's how mm -hmm. you're describing it. That is what they're doing. They're focusing on illusions to some extent and you do need something, someone, some source to bring you back. If you make one area of interest or one idea the center of your life, you have, you're not having a real life. You've distorted your life. Uh, you've become obsessive. And you can look like a very successful professional within that because you're a genius at what you do. But unless you're relating everything to the rest of the wider world and the wonder of the world, you've become lost. Now, you mentioned your wife. My wife and I, we have a running gag, and it's a line that you use yeah. practically in the book, and it's the importance of laughter. And I can hear her in the booth right now because every time my wife's favorite saying is, I love to laugh. And I say, you know, well, who doesn't, honey? But you also mean it the way she does in this profound sense. A, in the profound sense of your marriage, the importance of the ability mm -hmm. for two people to share in that laughter, and also, with your animal, as, as, as you say, I, I won't find it exactly, but I remember it was, they like to watch you play the fool. Mm -hmm. They get that same sense. They appreciate that laughter at that same deep level. I believe both our wives get a sense of it. Yeah, I say one thing that you find out in marriage, each of you learns in a different way at some point, is we're both married to great fools. And that's one of the joys of being married. Oh, oh we've got a whole lines on that, but I'm not going to get into it. But that is the truth. Yeah, and if you can understand that about yourself and your mate, and ne neither of you take offense of it, and where you're able to laugh at yourself and you can laugh at each other, uh, the dog, dogs love to play the fool. And if they recognize that you do it, oh boy, this is the best that the dog can have. And so playtime becomes a, a, a time when we can just be foolish with one another. Dean, I can talk with you forever, but our time is up, and I do want to end with these words. The only wisdom is humility. 
which engenders gratitude and humility is the condition of the heart essential for us to know peace. I want to thank you, Dean, for sharing the essentials and helping give a little bit more peace to all our hearts. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thanks for having me here. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's my pleasure, and thank you guys for joining us. Now, before Dean leaves, I would like to leave you with these words from a big little life. In each little life, we can see great truth and beauty. And in each little life, we glimpse the way of all things in the universe. If we allow ourselves to recognize the mystery and the wonder of existence, our fogged minds clear. Thinking clearly, we follow wonder to awe. And in a state of awe, we are as close to true wisdom as we will ever be. I'm Barry Kibrick. Think clearly when you read between those lines and you will feel the awe and be as close to true wisdom as ever. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you. If you'd like to get in touch with us, want a DVD or transcript of our show, catch an episode online, or receive our weekly updates, go to www.klcs.org slash btl.